Uh, welcome everyone. Um, first I'd like to say thank you for coming this evening. It's been a uh, great turnout, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure you've read the meeting invite and that uh, Peter's advocacy of R and his uh, and of better analytical practice precedes him. So I won't talk too much um, about that uh, at the moment, but uh, Peter will be, pre be presenting this evening on his two models predicting the New Zealand general election using uh, polling data. Uh, it's very topical, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, before I welcome Peter to the stage, I would like to just do some quick housekeeping as well. Uh, firstly, a big thanks to those who answered the community questionnaire. Um, it's pre pre uh, proving very useful in uh, helping us to uh, organise future meetups. Um, I'm in, in the process of contacting those who um, showed interest in presenting, so um, I'll be doing that over the next few weeks. Secondly, we are always on the lookout for volunteers to help um, in presenting and uh, offering venues and in uh, organising meetings. So if you have, if you'd like to volunteer, feel free to email us on uh, wellington.rug at gmail.com up on the board there, or on the meetup.com website. Uh, lastly, we are open to members who are interested in smaller, more informal get-togethers in between these larger meetings. So if you're interested in um, hosting or organising one of those, please get in touch as well. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Peter Ellis to the stage. Thanks very much. Um, you know, it's a great pleasure to be here and um, talking about this, so I'll um, hop straight into it. So, once I work out my technology... left-handed or right-handed mouse. So basically, today I'm going to be talking really in uh, four sorts of ways. I'm going to talk about um, a bit of an overview of, of my election forecasts. And then I'm going to talk about the three phases which are really behind that forecasting. So I'm going to talk about the data, where it comes from, how I manage that, and, um, uh, uh, and how it's got its own R package, which is actually available for a much wider set of uses than this. I'm going to be talking about the statistical modelling side. So I've got these two different statistical models which take slightly different angles, which is interesting in itself, and also how we implement that. And I think that for some of you it might be new using this, um, this language, STAN, which is not technically an R language, but it integrates very well with it and um, uh, really greatly extends the capabilities that we've got with R. Then finally, I'm going to talk briefly about the dissemination side of it, which again is all still done with R, but with the help of, of, um, of friends such as Jekyll and Markdown. But there's a, um, a shiny app which I'll be showing and briefly talk about how that's used to disseminate some of this through, um, uh, through an interactive web tool. So just to help me pitch this first, I thought I'd do like one of these hands up things. So, so, so I know where people have come from, from. So who's written at least a few lines of R code? Uh, I thought that would probably be most people. So who's uh, uh, made a plot with ggplot and comfortable with that? Keep your hands up and put it up again if you've got a view on that pipe operator and, and mutate and that third dot point. Okay, who's actually built their own R package? Much less, great. Who's written anything with Stan? Awesome, just two of us, so that's good. So a uh, song fiddly keeps quiet, I can uh, say what I like. Now, has anyone written an article that went viral and destroyed a statistician's career? <laughs> no? Good, just checking. <laughs> and anyone here stood for parliament? Okay, good, no, okay. So I was expecting more people on that first one than towards the end, and that's pretty much the way that it turned out. <laughs> so it's always good to check. <clears throat> so basically, ultimately, this stuff is all aimed at this question of, well, who's going to win the election? And so this for me is uh, sort of like the headline. New Zealand elections are a little bit more complicated to predict than a lot of other elections because there's usually more than two probable outcomes. And so one of the things we'll go into is how I do that. Um, on this chart, I've got what I chose early on in the process as five particularly interesting, likely sort of coalition groupings. So one was this idea that national might win by themselves. So I'm predicting there's about a 2% chance of that. Second is the idea of a coalition basically the same as what they've currently got. So that would be, um, uh, of course, themselves, the Maori Party, ACT, uh, United Future. I think that's it. And um, 
Then the other main one was uh, this idea of Labour and Green winning by themselves. You can see I'm predicting that's got a 0% chance of happening. Uh, there's been a bit of uh, uh, critique me of that on Twitter recently, so we can talk about that as well. And finally, that big orange bar is the chance that, well, uh, whatever happens, New Zealand First will have the balance of power. You can see I'm predicting that's the most likely thing. If suddenly there's a non-trivial chance of basically an exact tie, so which um, would um, uh, pose some interesting things of the day after election, I'm sure. So when I take the same model that I'm using now and I go back to the data we had six months before the last election, I had quite different predictions. So this was part of my validation. This is a sensible thing. In fact, I was predicting basically a two-thirds chance of exactly what happened. So that made me feel much more confident that the model was not completely insane and actually gave a reasonable prediction of that. But the, um, I also, early, early on when I did this, uh, a few people commented on Twitter, they said, well, this is a little bit odd, like, you know, why is it up to you to choose which side United Future would join in or NZ First, something like that. And that's actually a very good point. And so my next idea was, oh, we'll do this massive matrix visualization of all the possible combinations of parties and let's let people choose. Realize that's actually a little bit too much. So instead, I built this little uh, shiny app, which basically lets people make their own coalitions, no matter how improbable. So Greens, the National, the Maori Party together. And we'll basically say, well, if, if they happen to choose to go together, it's interesting, saying they've got pretty much a 100% chance of getting at least half the seats. If I swap out National and put in Labour in there, we're seeing here a probabilistic distribution of the number of seats. So the key thing that is happening here is that underlying this, I've got predictions of what the party vote is going to be. I've got some plausible uh, ideas on what might happen in the key party seats that make a difference because of the way seats are allocated in New Zealand. I've talked a little bit about that down the track as well. And um, basically, I let people manipulate some of that because these, these uh, <laughs> seats, there's basically no reliable polling data. There's one poll on Ahariu and, and none on the rest that I'm aware of. So I've basically had to make up estimates of, of uh, the chances of uh, people winning that. And so I thought, well, it's only fair to let people play around a bit and see if my assumptions were wrong, what difference does that do to these other things? So this is, this is sort of the end game um, of, of uh, what I'm aiming at. Letting people basically see a range of the probabilities of the number of seats for any particular given uh, combination of parties that they care to choose in their choose your own, choose your own coalition. And so the rest of the talk really is about, well, how do I get there? So I'm trying to remember how my technology works. I've got these two models, and I'm calling model A and model B. I basically prefer model A because it's less volatile, and we'll get into some of the reasons for that later. Model B, uh, a month or so back, only a few weeks back, was basically predicting a very strong chance for the national or their current coalition uh, winning. I've chosen that of like, if I had to have just one number, that's sort of the simplest one, which is basically the returning of the current government. And um, so if I want to do a thing over time, that's the, that's the number which I'm showing. So you can see that, um, First of all, I only introduced Model B a while back because it's a bit more complicated. And um, model, model A hasn't changed too much over time, the chances of that. But interestingly, just at the last polling, they basically converged right together. And um, that's basically happened with just a minor dip in the nationals polls in June and July. They had a bit of a, uh, a bounce, probably related to the budget. Certainly was <coughs> just after the budget, whether it was caused by that or not. Nationals uh, went up a bit. And so my Model B is quite a bit more responsive to those sorts of changes, I think too responsive, whereas Model A, uh, for interesting reasons, is much more inclined to just charge along and think that the long-term trend is the one that's worth worrying about. So that's how my forecasts have changed over time. So we've seen the uh, app. This is just a static picture of my best estimates of the the range of possibilities for the number of seats. So the New Zealand Parliament has at least 120 seats. Um, it, it's, there's a slight random number itself, which is how many seats it's going to have, and that's because of the complexities of the voting system here. So if a uh, 
party gets people who win electorate seats, but they don't get enough party votes to just to uh, to cover the people they've got there. You get what they call an overhang. So we've got one of them at the moment with the uh, United Future Party. Uh, Peter Dunn uh, got voted in in his electorate seat, but they get practically no party vote, and so that becomes an extra extra seat in Parliament. So we've got, um, I think, at the moment, 121 uh, seats. Um, interestingly, see. One of the things I predict is, is how many seats that might be, and you can imagine as many as 126. That's, if you get out to that number, that would sort of depend on the Maori party doing really well in the Maori seats, and, but getting practically no party vote, which could lead to that significant number of things there. So that's another interesting complication with the, uh, with the um, uh, system here. So the Conservative Party, when I started doing this, they were still like, they seemed like a real thing, but. Um, now they're pretty much uh, uniformly predicted to be zero. And um, so I'd probably take them out of the model and put in the Opportunities Party who've got this interesting chance of maybe getting over the 5% threshold if I had the time. So let's start with the data. So I want you to imagine in your head, and I'm going to show you in a second, that this polls object here is a lovely tidy data frame. It's basically got a column for the middle of the period that the poll was taken. It's got a column which is the, uh, the voting intention for a particular combination of a party and for a particular pollster. So this little snippet of ggplot code basically produced this graphic, which is the um, data, uh, all the polling data which is actually freely publicly available at the moment, which goes back to 2002. So the circles are showing the um, uh, actual election results. And all the various colored lines are from the different uh, polling companies, which over this period, there have been 13 of them, have taken, um, uh, been taking polls over some of this time. Now at the moment, there's actually only three pollsters who are actively uh, publishing um, polls. But at various times, there have been um, quite a few more. So one of the things that's interesting about this, and sorry, in the washed out, look, you may not see. This is National, New Zealand First, Labour, and Green. Like, I mean, there's obviously some interesting political things happening here, right? So NZ First uh, had a real dip towards the, um, the end of the last uh, Labour-led government, and they've been recovering ever since. Um, Labour have had basically a tough 15 years over the time of these polls. Um, Greens had like a level shift at about the time of the last election, uh, two elections ago, 2011 election. And Nationals, so at the start of this, they had one of their worst results ever. Um, this must have been when they came into government in the 2007 election, and they consolidated a little bit since then. And so obviously, some of the political expectations, some, some of this is people are saying, oh, you know, they've won four elections now. Three. Three. Yeah, this is the first one they won, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so they won three elections now. And, uh, you know, is this arc going to sort of start coming down? Uh, and is Labour about to bounce back up again? Or are things going to consolidate at the level they're at? Now, one of the other things I'll draw your attention to here, which is interesting, is particularly visible in the NZ first in the last two elections is that they, their election results would be much better than any of their polls. And um, uh, that's something which I'll be taking into account later. Now there's also, um, with the Greens, there's um, the perceived wisdom is that the Greens poll better than they, um, than they actually get on election day. And that's generally true, though, um, you can see most of the colour is above the circles, but not all of it. And so that's something else we'll come to as well. And um, a few other interesting things, including um, uh, Labour had this really interesting cycle in the last election period where halfway between the elections they seemed to be really doing well and they had a very bad year coming up to the election. And that's reflected in the things going the other way around. So there's a whole bunch of interesting dynamics going on in that data, including that it's all measured by different people and it's all um, going in different patterns. There's long patterns, there's little short patterns. 
So where did that poles object come from? <coughs> Basically, ultimately, for me, it comes from Wikipedia. And this is what it looks like on Wikipedia. Um, so this is the, uh, the, they've got a page, in this case, for the polling for the 2005 election campaign. And they have one of those pages for every year, and some public spirited person keeps them up to date. And these days, very, very fast. So a poll comes up. I, uh, when I get home at night and I go to Wikipedia, I often find that whoever this public spirited person is has already done the update. So I don't know, maybe it's someone in this room. If they haven't, sometimes I do it. So, um, so Wikipedia, um, there's a few things about this which make it not very tidy. Um, one is that, um, for those of you who know this, this language of tidy data, this Hadley Wickham idea, the party, each party's got its own column, and so that's a bit of a no-no because they've basically messed up a, a value variable with the columns. Um, so a better thing would be for it to be longer and thinner, more normalized in database speak. Um, the dates come in a sort of a variety of formats, and uh, it's worse than it looks there, but you can see things like Sometimes they've got an M dash between the dates, and sometimes it's just a little hyphen, a um, bunch of other annoying things like that. The other thing that makes this non-tidy is that in the poll uh, column, they've mixed up two things. There's the pollster who's taking the poll, and there's the customer. So like N NBR, HP, Invent, um, that's an interesting combination. So NBR is a newspaper, HP, Invent is a firm that actually does polling. And same here for say One News, Coma Brunton. So One News uh, is a media organisation. Coma Brunton is a polling organisation. Part of being paid for doing that is One News obviously wants the publicity, so they insist that their, their branding be closely associated with the name wherever it appears, which goes through Wikipedia. So that's nice, but if um, you get this situation, as does happen over that 15-year period, you get. Uh, a pollster that actually works for several different customers, then um, uh, you, we need to sort of separate that out if we're interested in pollsters, as I am. So basically, I want it to look like this. A column for the pollster, a column for the client, if there is one, a column for which election year is coming forward, and a column for each party. So each, each poll is now going to have seven or eight rows of data in this to make it tidy in, in Wickham sense or or a little bit closer to normalized in the databasing sense. And so this, this is available in this object polls, which is part of the NZ Elect R package, which is uh, my package. It's available on CRAN, but about three months out of date as far as the polls are there, because CRAN's policy is to only uh, let you update things by about every three months or so, which is fair enough. So there's a more recent version on, on GitHub if you want the very latest polls. So my plan was to briefly go through how some of that works. So I have a repository of code, which is hosted on GitHub. So who knows what GitHub is? Nearly everyone, OK. Who uses GitHub? About two thirds, great. So basically, this is a bit of a tale of three GitHub repositories. I've got one for creating this NZ Lect R package. I've got one which does the forecasting, and I've got another one which hosts my website. And so um, this is the front page of, the, uh, of all the code for NZ Elect. So one of the things about how I structure um, uh, a repository hosting a R package, which is a little bit different to the way that, say, the R Studio approach, I always have the package source code as a subfolder. So in this case, the, the um, package one subfolder contains all of the, all of the source code for the NZLect R package. One of the reasons for doing that is that I, means I can also have package two. It's actually a separate R package, but it's, got, it's sharing some of the preparation code. Uh, package two in this case is the NZ census, which has got a whole bunch of mesh block and area unit census data for New Zealand. And I have them all tied together in, um, by this build uh, script. So basically, when I get new data, um, which is normally obviously new polling data, because this polls happen more frequently than censuses, the, um, 
I just run this build script and it runs through a bunch of various things including importing historical election results, importing things like voting lo locations, importing census data, and then individually it, it, it downloads the polls for 2005, 2008 and so on and then combines the polls. It's got a few little tests. Uh, this line is basically a test to see uh, when there's a new poll added, only the new poll should be different or the historical one should be the same. So this line is basically there to alert me just in case, because I'm using Wikipedia and I'm rebuilding this thing from scratch every time. Someone could go to Wikipedia and change all the old data, um, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse, so at the very least I want to be alerted to that, so I have a little check in for what's happening there. Let's make sure I've got time to talk about the interesting stuff. I'll just briefly go through the um, oh, wrong one. So in this folder prep, I have um, a, a bunch of things doing preparation, but this is the this is the bit which actually downloads polls. So it defines the URL. It, um, it basically reads in the HTML from there, and then so this is this is one of the interesting bits. You'll see that um, it separates out that into a table, and that's all very nice. You've seen one of the things was there were those messy dates. And frankly, I couldn't be bothered actually passing those dates. There's not enough of them. So it's easier for me to actually basically manually type in the date. Now, obviously, that's slightly suboptimal, but uh, previous people have, you know, there, there is code out there which tries to pass these dates and gets it 99% right. And uh, basically, you know, it's not 10 a day, it's easy just to type the bloody things in. Area for possible future improvement. So every time there's a poll, uh, the one thing I have to type in is actually the starting date and the ending date for the polling period. That'll um, be enough of that. Go back to... Oh, that's a lot of back keys. Maybe I'll do it differently next time. So some of the things which are interesting to reflect on that, um, version control is obviously sort of essential for all sorts of reasons. Um, I like to separate out all the grooming and so on, which in this case is quite a lot. There's quite an elaborate amount of grooming, a lot more than what I showed there because it's also grabbing stuff from the Electoral Commission and Stats NZ. Uh, I like to keep that sort of separated from the actual source code which gets built into the R package. Um, I, I use a single project which can be bigger than an R package, which also means, again in that case I, d I didn't show you there, this little shiny app that comes off those R packages as well, means I can have that nice and separated. Um, building everything with a single script, which in that case is called build.r, which builds the whole thing from scratch. It's like if it wasn't just all in R, I might use a make file or something for that. I actually find it easier to do everything with an R script, which basically calls all the other R scripts. And um, yeah, this last point, sometimes you can come to something which is actually easier to do by hand, depending on the context, of course. So, statistical modeling. There's three challenges in turning those polling data into uh, actual predictions. So one is the one which gets all the attention, which is the sampling error from surveys. People report this like it's the only thing around of uh, error, margin of error of plus or minus two or three percent. And yes, that does count, but those margins of errors are calculated for basically, you know, scientists taking a sample out of the <coughs> fridge and measuring them, where they, you know, you've got complete control of all the measurement, all of the random sampling, and all that sort of thing. Um, so the second challenge there. Other, other, other challenges for surveys, there's basically this whole concept of total survey error, which, which amounts to things like biases that we don't know about and the sorts of people who respond and you can't control for in the weighting. Uh, in this case, there's this, uh, some of it gets wrapped up into house effects. Because I've got three or four pollsters who are taking these regular polls, one of the things I need to take into account for, well, is Roy Morgan happen to be a bit more optimistic for the Greens than, than um, Comar Branton is, and so on. So, so long as the total survey error is a bit consistent for the pollsters, I can at least control for some of it from that. Um, if they, uh, Comar Branton, 
find a mistake and improve it from election to election. That makes it actually much harder for me. Well, obviously, probably better for them. And the third one is that, well, people might change their mind. So these polls are normally questions that said, if the election were held tomorrow, who would your party vote for? And of course, the election's not going to be held tomorrow. It's going to be in five weeks' time or something, whatever it is. So between now and then, even if they're answering in good faith, they might change their mind. And in fact, in the political science literature, there's quite good evidence that they do, or alternatively, they gradually realise their mind as they get closer to it. And one of the ways they know that is that if you predict election results based on things like the economy and, and that sort of stuff, when you're a year out, those predictions are better than asking the polls, which shouldn't actually happen unless people are influenced by those things in ways they don't really understand, which, of course, is quite plausible. So what looks like it's happening there is that people say, oh, yeah, of course I'm going to vote for so-and-so. As they get close to the time, maybe they make up their mind and uh, converge on something. Now, whether it really works like that or not is obviously an active area of research. So, to get around those three things, uh, both my methods do something in common, which is basically, they say, instead of looking at this survey as just like it's a survey, how many people like dish dishwashing liquid or something, we say, let's treat the points that we've got from the various surveys as though they're observations which is then going to predict something in the future. So basically I treat them as a time series uh, that's predicting the future rather than a, something that's just measuring a state of interest today. And um, in order to do that, I treat both the normal sampling error and house effect and everything else as, as nuisance factors rather than as the most important thing. So then once I've got a prediction of the party vote on the actual day, I turn that into a simulation of votes. So I basically I predict oh, there's going to be a, actually I do a, a multivariate normal distribution with here's the seven means for the seven, a vector of seven numbers for the seven different parties and a correlation matrix for them because if Labour's vote goes up, Greens goes down and so on, so we can't uh, predict them independently. And then I simulate 10,000 possible results from that, get all the correlated results. And then... Uh, based on who wins in little simulations, the electorate seats, I turn those simulated party votes into simulated seats. That's what forms those histograms we had before. And um, uh, we'll see, in fact, we'll see if I click on this link, which, um, that in, in the second repository I'm talking about, which is called NZ Election Forecasts, um, a few uh, functions which help with that. So, so some of them are uh, just little things like this one, which just like sets the sets the fonts and themes and so on. I'm going to use and all the images through here. But um, this function simulates seats. Now, obviously, you're not going to be able to sort of read this, or maybe you can see some of it. But basically, this defines a function which takes a set of simulated party votes and turns them into numbers of seats. So I've got a function that does this because I've got two models and you know, conceivably I could expand it later. So it's something which I'm going to want to do multiple times. So obviously one of the, uh, one of the uh, efficiency things here is that if you're going to do something multiple times, particularly something reasonably complicated like uh, taking a set of party votes, turning them to seats, drawing a graphic for where the seats are, it's good to turn that into a function so you can uh, do it multiple times easily enough without repeating a whole bunch of code. I just found out this morning that Chrome has shortcut buttons for alt, left and right arrow, which does forward and backwards, which I quite like. So this is model A. Model A basically uses generalized additive models. Who's familiar with generalized additive models? Okay, cool. So a generalized additive model is basically an extension of good old-fashioned linear regression that allows you to have a spliny curvy bit as part of the predictor. So whereas a generalized linear model uh, lets you have um, different response variables, not just normally distributed but binomially distributed or, or counts or something like that, 
generalized attitude models take it one step further by saying, okay, instead of having a linear predictor and then a response variable with a particular distribution, you can have a curvy predictor and a family of doing that. So in this particular case, um, I'm using this as a uh, way of basically trying to crudely model what happens during one election cycle. So you see, I'm actually starting these models just at the last election in 2014. And I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm giving it a certain amount of scope to be curvy, and I've controlled that for the different ones, for reasons I'll go into. And um, uh, it's very much doing a trend. So this is what's basically used in my model A. And the reason why it's quite conservative is, as you can imagine, as things fluctuate around here, it's, it's very much the overall line that's controlling things. And so for NZ first, they've had this general period of getting stronger and stronger through this current uh, period of government. And that, that's quite a lot of points, which is basically pulling their line upwards. And so although it's curved, it's not curved very much. And I've deliberately stopped all of these curves being really flexible because basically there's just not enough data to justify it. So the number of points we've got is, um, I don't know how many, but as I've forgotten now, but it's not very many, it's about 100 or so. If I'm predicting all of these nine different parties' results, and, uh, um, uh, and each one of them is trying to use, say, three degrees of freedom to add curviness, that's a lot of degrees of freedom being used up for for that curviness. So I've deliberately restricted them to not being too wobbly. We can talk about that in questions if we want. So in this particular model, before I fit those things, I actually adjust the poles for the house effects. And um, I, I was going to go and show code to do that, but I won't. I'll just explain it because the uh, because um, of time and because looking at code is not that interesting. This will go up, and so you can follow the links yourself if you want to see them, which is probably much more satisfying. But the basic way of how it does it is it goes to each one of the previous election cycles that we've got, and fits that exact same model, fits that same GAM, and it looks at, okay, fitting that GAM, and we predicted Labour, we predicted NZ first, and we compare that to the actual election result, see, how far out are they for every combination of pollster and uh, um, uh, uh, party? And so you get this matrix of, I'm only using three pollsters because there's no point worrying about ones that aren't doing any now. So you get three pollsters by eight, nine parties and you get on average how far they've been out. And that gives me a sense of like an estimate of the structured bias in the pollsters. But there's another bit of the error when you come to the election, which isn't just their bias, it's just that, well, there's this randomness on election day um, of people changing their minds, basically. So I also try and, s I, I basically iterate and do the same thing again. This time I say, even after I adjust for biases, how far out are people? And, um, oh yeah, I do have a graphic on that. And I looked at the mean square error for my predictions in each previous election for each previous party. And along the bottom, we've got the actual party vote that these people got. And up here is how far out my model was in predicting it, at least the squared error of that. And there's basically a sort of linear relationship between the squared error of how far out my, my predictions are and the size of the party. So the bigger the party vote, unsurprisingly, the better they are at estimating it because there's less volatility. And so I use that little model to basically predict, here's going to be an extra bonus bit of variance that when I predict party vote on any particular day, uh, on the election day, I'm going to say, don't just give it the randomness I get from having an uncertain model and then individual variance in that uncertain model. Also give it the variance of this, which is how much that model has been out in particular in previous years. Um, I'll go back to, because there's a nice simple example of the STAN program here. I'm hoping Amy 
you tap to work with some full screen mode. So this is about as simple a STAN program as you can get. And so what STAN is, STAN is a probabilistic programming language which basically lets you specify the statistical model. And um, uh, it lets you specify it very directly, much more so than in R, where you're more likely to be specifying, you know, multiply this by that and so on. In STAN, you tell things like, I'm going to have a bunch of random variables. Uh, this one's distributed normally with that, so that's actually my Bayesian prior for the size of the house effect. I'm saying that house effects will be on average zero, that's before I know anything, with a um, standard deviation of 0.15. Now that's on a low good scale, so it's difficult to think of what that might mean. And this is the, this is how far out, the, um, this is the actual random variable, the discrepancies, which is how much party vote for each party came in compared to the actual vote when they had. I'm saying that's going to be normally distributed with whatever this thing is and that sort of distribution. So basically what it lets you do, without going into the specifics of that, is it lets you just specify almost like you're a statistician writing a bunch of this is distributed this way, this is distributed that way, and so on. You tell it, here's my data coming in. There's one data which is the n, the length of things. I've got another data of the discrepancies. And these are the parameters I want you to estimate. And these are their distributions. There may be the prior distributions and some metaparameters and stuff. And you just feed in your data to that with the R stan R package. And um, it does <coughs> of chain Monte Carlo magic and comes back with a distribution of that's plausible for these parameters which we've asked it to estimate. <coughs> so the, um, now this is about as simple a STAN program as you will get. My main one on the next one is a little bit more complicated. I basically used it here because when I just estimated the house effects directly by looking at um, for each pollster how much out had they been on average, the numbers were too big. For effectively, I only had like about three observations for each combination of party and election. One of the things about elections, there's not very many, right? So, you know, it would be nice to have a thousand observations of elections, but that's not going to happen for 3,000 years. So, we, we and MMP may well change in the meantime. So, um, what I do uh, in, in this case, the purpose of this is this is this is basically a bit of regularization. I'm basically squashing those numbers down towards zero because they are implausibly long way, way from the zero. And that's why I ended up using STAN for this at all. Model B. I actually prefer Model B as a statistician. It's much more satisfying. It's actually much simpler to code. So like if you do follow those links through when you look at the presentation, there's a lot of fiddliness going on. There's lots of ad hoc things. Like I mean, that came through in my description, right? You know, uh, control for bias of house effects and control for randomness in the model, then randomness in the individual bits of the model, then a bit of bonus randomness from just being wrong in the past. It all feels very sort of ad hoc. And um, you know, that number 0.15, where the hell did that come from? Uh, in when I was regularizing down the house effects and so on. What Model B does is it uses this, this, this um, method called latent state space modeling, which is much more intuitively satisfying by basically modeling everything all at once. And so it basically puts forward this idea that at any one point in time, there is um, people's tendency to vote for any particular party. So it so happens we don't observe it every day. In fact, we only observe it really precisely every three years on election day. But in between election day, we get dirty, unsatisfactory measurements on the face of these polls. And we know the polls have got sampling error, and they've got other errors, and they've got biases, and so on. But we say, if we treat people's voting intention for each party on each day as a parameter to estimate, you can say, what's the most likely value or that parameter given, maybe we saw a poll four days earlier, and we saw another one seven days earlier. And if you hypothesize some idea for how that latent variable pro progresses from day to day, 
you can get a single statistical model that combines all of that. Now, it does mean you have, in this case, about 20,000 parameters to estimate, which is quite a lot. So you've got seven parties that I'm estimating, including the other, and um, I'm estimating them, their values on every day for the last six or so years. So that's, does that come out to be about right? Six times 360 times seven, it's about 20,000. I think I've, I worked that once. That's why I use a computer, right? <laughs> you don't have to do that sort of stuff in your head. And um, so you've got 20,000 parameters to estimate. But the satisfaction of that is that in your model, as well as having a parameter for each day, you can say, OK, and another parameter is going to be the average amount that um, Roy Morgan is out for NZ first. And then another parameter is the average amount they're out for Greens, and so on, for each combination of that. And that all goes into the same model and you can fit it all simultaneously. So this is, a, this is now quite a complicated model. Um, I mean, obviously it's got lots of parameters, but it's also got lots of moving parts. Uh, but the net result comes out nice and um, plausibly. It's like basically we say that, okay, we've got these periods where we measure the intention with really low error. And uh, in between, the latent voting intention moves around and you have these dirty observations. Basically, you can see the NZ first, it's basically saying, well, given what happened at the end and at the beginning of this period, these poles seem to be systematically low. And it can basically uh, compare, well, what's the chance that versus the pulse has all just got really, really unlucky in their samples time after time after time. And it can take all of that into account simultaneously rather than first estimating the house effects, then this, that, the other, which my model A does. Now the disadvantage is you're very vulnerable to how you've specified the underlying uh, change. And so in my case, I said I'm going to assume that the underlying change for each party is a random walk. So that when you ask tomorrow what it's going to be, we say, well, on average it will probably be today, plus or minus a bit. And I let it estimate how much that bit is based on the data, so for uh, some parties it, it estimates more than for others, which is just more parameters to, to specify. But what that means, in effect, particularly when you don't have very many polls, is that um, the last few polls become really quite sort of important because it, it, it like drags them up to that value then says, oh, well, from here we sort of expect it's going to stay on average the same as this. And we'll say it might not, might go up, might go down. So you can see each of these things fan out. But you see that that last little bit of uncertainty, this model is always predicting that uh, it's probably going to be the same as it is now. Now, sometimes that might be right. Intuitively, I feel that NZ first might keep getting stronger. Um, yeah, it's actually a very difficult judgment call. And I think we'd need some uh, to very carefully do it to consider the political science of it. My main reason for not liking it so much is, as I saw on one of those early charts, this one's really quite volatile. So as the poles move around, this operates almost like a, a weighted pole in terms of where it thinks it's going to go, which just doesn't feel as plausible as my more stable first one. So I will... Um, did that work? So within my um, stats, uh, my forecasting thing, I've got a subfolder which holds the just the um, the state space part of it. So this is an example of where like nearly all the munging work is done in R. So in R, I'm uh, loading up some party colours, loading up some polls, and filtering them to to just the last two election cycles and the parties I'm interested in, and a bit more managing around with that. Then eventually, I create this big, long list of data, which is basically the, uh, each individual pollster's predictions for each individual party. And I feed it to this function, STAN. And STAN goes away to a STAN program, which, which it then compiles and um, in, in C++, so it runs very fast, relatively speaking. 
and, um, and comes back with the answers of a distribution. So this is an example of a more complicated STAN program. But it's still, in a sense, not that complicated. So STAN can't deal with ragged arrays, so like um, uh, arrays of different lengths of things. So there's a bit of duplication in the way I've had to specify some of this stuff, which in R you'd find other ways around doing. But the basic idea of defining a set of um, the data that's going to come in, which is quite a bit in this case, the parameters I want to estimate. So I've, I've got this epsilon parameter, which is like basically the innovation every day in everyone's latent party vote. And a, a model where basically I'm saying that um, the most important thing is that those things are distributed on average, they're zero, and they've got this covariance matrix for how they change, because again, you know, labor changes in the opposite direction of the greens and, and so on. And um, so that's specifying the important bit of how much things are changing each day. You add up um, 700 days worth of that, you get your prediction of the, at the end. Sort of constrained by the measurement model, which is basically saying, well, you know, you can't just go anywhere with your innovations. You've got to go reasonably close to where the poles are. So we specify the poles as having a particular distribution. You can specify the prior for how much you expect that to be. And they're basically, as it works out, the most likely values for all those little innovations it get sucked up towards uh, the poles, depending on how uncertain it treats each different poles. And we also have, you can estimate, um, while we're at it, the actual pulsar effect for each combination of pulsar and party. So what we've got here is actually quite a complicated model with a lot of things interacting. And I can specify it in reasonably intuitive language, which I mean, you can have a look and agree or not about whether it's reasonably intuitive. But it's vastly easier than it would have been to try and fit it directly, um, directly in R. And in fact, you know, a lot of it looks quite similar to R anyway, but it's just like, what I quite like about it is this really nice declarative way you say, okay, this particular thing is going to be normally distributed, this other thing is something else. Here's the parameters. You just come back and tell me what the most likely values is for those parameters. Right. So, um, I won't talk too long about this stuff. So the, the Shiny app at the end. So who here has used Shiny? Quite a few. OK, cool. So um, it's actually reasonably unremarkable. So um, one of the last steps uh, in, in my main uh, forecasts uh, repository, there's a master file that runs everything one bit at a time. So it says, make sure you've got the most recent value of the NZLX library. Um, fit the GAM model, fit the state space model. And um, when in the process of fitting those, it's created various standard graphics. And so then it has another step, which is copy all those graphics over to my web science project. And then it says, and shove the data into this subfolder. I've got sims, which is basically holding all the simulated votes from the two different models. And then push this Shiny app up onto, onto the shinyapps.io website. And I've got a little flag whether it goes onto a test or the production version of that. Not that it really matters in the case of me, but it's a habit. And um, the actual Shiny app, the, maybe the only thing that's sort of likely interest is that it's using ggviz, which sort of three years ago was all the rage and was going to be the thing for um, our interactive graphics. And I still quite like, although uh, development seems to have completely stalled. And so those um, nice uh, interactive histograms and things that were on the, the first app that I showed you are all created with, um, somewhere down here, <laughs> with uh, ggviz, <coughs> which has got a um, uh, syntax which is similar to ggplot and I find quite intuitive. So the GG stands for Grammar of Graphics, same as ggplot. And um, it, when it fits into a shiny app like this, it handles all of those transitions and things automatically. It's very easy to add um, uh, 
<coughs> tooltips. So for instance, in this case, I define a little tooltip as a function, which um, basically, if you remember, I hovered over the histogram and it says, well, they've got a 30% chance of getting over. This little function that basically works out that probability and generates a little bit of text. And then when I want to add the tooltip, it's just like add tooltip, and you give it the name of that function, and it works out for you. So very easy. My JavaScript is, is basic to poor, so it's um, uh, much easier for me to do that sort of thing. I won't even bother showing the UI for that. The script is very easy. And so, yeah, the final thing is that um, uh, a little script that um, is a bunch of files that I need which are in my website to, to update. So it takes all of them. Um, some of them are in SVG. So first thing it does is it uses the image magic program, which converts between image formats to save them as PNGs so that because basically Facebook and Twitter don't accept SVGs, scalable vector graphics. So you need to have an old-fashioned uh, raster image if you want to post on Twitter. And so I make those PNGs, and then it just copies over all of those files to the, to the relevant bit of my personal folder system, which hosts my website. So this, this slide here is the only thing in this whole repository which should, in principle, not work. Put it away. In principle, everything else in this repository should be able to clone it and run it from scratch until you get to this line. Uh, unless you've also, of course, cloned my um, <laughs> <laughs> website and, and put it somewhere called penis stroke documents, <laughs> which would be a little bit creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be done, because that also is a uh, repository. And um, so the very last thing I'll show you is that, actually. So the, it's a, this is the GitHub repository for this little bit of my website. This one repository covers the whole thing. And so there's just these little files there in Markdown. And so I just change manually one thing, which is the change log. And this is just written in Markdown, simple text thing, very basic formatting. And I just write a little manual comment. Yeah, I added in an extra poll or whatever. And all the other things in, um, in this folder should basically um, uh, be, be stable. So, for instance, the elections.md is the main page. Um, it just refers to things, it refers to the images, is the key thing. And so, the, let's see if that works, yeah. And so, the whole website is built with this thing called Jekyll, which obviously you don't have time to talk about, but it then um, uh, builds this thing. When I commit this to GitHub, I commit the built version. There's different ways you can do this, but I always build mine at home and send it up to GitHub. Uh, GitHub basically hosts it as a website. And, uh, um, and there we have it. So there's all the latest images and everything which have been produced by that. So basically what happens on a um, new uh, polling day, I get the poll, I grab it from Wikipedia, push up my new NZ elect to GitHub, Go to the second repository, um, just hit build and does everything automatically. And then go back to my website, hit Jekyll serve, check that everything looks all right, and push that up to GitHub as well. That's it. So I've gone a little bit longer than I meant to, but we've still got a bit of time for questions. So, hmm. If you had uh, more time, what would you work on in terms of trying to improve it or, or take it a step further? Um, two things. I think the promising one is the Model B, and so they're both be for that. So one is I would try to incorporate into it some sort of political science forecast, so something that takes into account the economy or something like that, and then use that as a Bayesian prior for the result, and the poll was just updating that, mm. which is sort of intuitively how we think of it. You look at it, oh yeah, the economy is really bad, they'll probably get voted out, uh, let's just see what the polls say to update that. That's exactly our thinking process. So that would be my number one. The second is to try and get something which takes a bit more into account this idea of momentum. 
I don't like the way the random walk behind there gets to a point, yeah, yeah, and flattens out. It just doesn't feel right to me. You haven't dealt with um, people who aren't voting at the moment. Is, yeah. that, is there a reason? Uh, yes. Um, there's two ways. Well, I sort of have, but there's two ways of doing it. So one way is to explicitly model how many people are voting and then talk about what proportion of people vote, vote for the parties. The other way is basically to say that I don't really care what voter turnout is, or like all that matters is how many people vote for each party. So it's more like I'm directly modelling the number of people voting for each party rather, rather than as a proportion of people who then are a proportion of something else. So that, that was my thinking anyway. Oh, plus it's easier for us. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think it matters to the degree that obviously the people who are marginal to turn out are also more likely to be for particular parties. But my intuition feels that that might be taken into account in all of this anyway. But the particular problem will be if there's a particular relationship between the polls and the people who think they're going to turn out and then turn out not to. And that's quite plausible there is such a relationship. It's bound to be a pretty complicated one. I'm not sure we could model it very well anyway. So, okay. So, what's the advantage of the Latin state-based model compared to, say, a rigid vector or regression model with something within in and One of the advantages is that um, uh, a lot of the the more standard time series things assume you've got equally spaced observations, and we don't here. You've got sparse observations, and then you get really frequent ones coming up towards the election, and they're sort of a random times part anyway. So if you try and do auto regression where you say this error is going to be correlated with the next error, it doesn't make any sense because the time periods are different. So basically, what we're doing here is we're explicitly modeling every single day. So we're making up a regular period and saying even though even though we don't have observations for most of them we can still estimate those regular periods underneath so i would say that's the main advantage unless you interpolate all the existing data to each, each day then you might do a then yeah. then change in the data how, yeah. how do you interpolate the yeah. well. you, you could and then if you've got enough data to do that you start getting the problem say if you're in the u.s where there's multiple poles in any one day. And this system expands that very easily because each pole is just another dirty observation of the true underlying state space. So a, a great, the more you have, the better. If you're modeling it with a, um, these are real observations of the real world, you've got to work out how you're going to average it. There's another ad hoc thing going on in there. So. One of the main reasons I, I like this second approach is it seems to remove a lot of ad hocery and systematize it into quite a, quite a neat mathematical way. Oh, sorry, you, yes? Uh, have you looked at the tweet data around polls? Sorry? Have you looked at the tweet data around? No, I haven't. <laughs> 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 this is only a hobby project, right? But yeah, that's, that's, that's worth doing. I'll have to look at, I have looked at Twitter data, but not in this context. Yeah. Um, Ernestine. Have you seen the Jacinda effect? Well, um, uh, there well, there's only been one poll since then, right? So, um, it, oh, might as well do this, this graphic is in the screen. So, with, it's most obvious to look at the Greens versus Labour, right? So this was the Greens' really good poll result, which for various complicated reasons led to their leader having to resign. <laughs> <laughs> and, this, and then this is the, the bad one that reflects the Jacinda effect, but not the resignation because the poll collection was basically before all that happened. Whereas in Labour, it's the other way around that they had two bad results, and there was also a third bad result that was leaked. So I don't use the leaked ones um, for partly for statistical reasons, mostly because they're not in Wikipedia. <laughs> but there's a good principled reason, which is that if people are only leaking them when they show something interesting, they're going to be quite badly biased. So it's like pre-registering your experiment. And so that's that's their good one since the Jacinda effect. So that, that's, 
that's definitely for real, but you can see they only need a few of them before it starts pulling up that number. This is actually a nice contrast with the model B. Um, so where is Labour? Labour is red there. So the Jacinda effect already brings up a tiny little up, uptick up here. So if they get another one up there, they'll be, I'd say, it will go reasonably substantially up there. So basically, I mean, we don't have very many polls in New Zealand, and there's probably only going to be, I don't know, four or five before the election. So, um, uh, and a lot of chaos happening, so we'll be interested to see. Um, both, both methods, of course, give these quite nice prediction intervals, so, um, which look to be plausible ranges. So, um, <coughs> I'll go for people who haven't asked a question yet, and then we'll start. So, yes? Um, like you were mentioning that we don't have that many polls in New Zealand, and so it sounds like forecast, like being able to forecast without having that data is probably quite advantageous. Um, obviously, the, like, the last US election, like 538 and that sort of been very in the media with regards to predicting and using, using sort of statistics to model election data. Have uh, you looked at the kind of methods that we're using to predict how polling numbers will influence election results, or is that just like too different a system to New Zealand to actually be applicable? Uh, I mean, I, I've certainly looked at what they've done in terms of predicting elections, and my Model A is um, was sort of inspired by what I understand they're doing, and the Model B is a more political science sort of alternative. Um, I haven't looked at that particular question of how... So, like, the polling and the discussion of the polling affects the mm -hmm. elections. I mean, I, I've read what Nate Silver writes, mm -hmm. and I, I mean, I think it's clear that there is an effect because people think that um, the pundits are right and therefore they... Yeah. Well, the other thing I noticed is because I remember they had, uh, they had sort of the, like you were mentioning, they have the, if the election were to happen now, what are the results going to be versus what do we think is going to happen between now and the election with regards to these numbers? Yeah. Um, and I, I never actually looked into kind of what methods are we using, but to, to kind of predict how things are going to work. I think it's a little bit of a cross between my two. So I don't, I don't think they're doing a formal state space model like this, but I think they are somehow assuming underneath that there's a bit of a random walk going on. And that, um, uh, so like if you, but they've, they've obviously got some reversion to mean happening, because I, I was looking at the how unpopular is Donald Trump thing today, and it's got, you know, he's, um, popularity is going right down, right? But they've, then they've got it sort of coming back up again in the forecast period. So they've obviously got some model that assumes there's some uh, regression yeah. to the mean, so it can't be a pure random walk, in which case it'd just be horizontal from that point. Uh, I suspect that they're doing the same thing with the election, but I don't know exactly why. Finley, second go. So the, the Green um, Party on this Model B doesn't have the step change in the predictions there. And, uh, and uh, am I right, the previous one did have a step change? Um, the one that showed the step change was when I showed a much longer period, because I think the step change was in 2011. And in principle, this I should be doing this model um, all the way I've got data, the more data the better, I except for two things. One is the model have to be a little bit more complicated because most likely things like house effects are changing over that time, and um, that's one thing. The other thing is that it's already quite computationally expensive. So this one takes about two hours to fit, and um, that's much better than when I first wrote it, because I'm not a very good stand programmer, and it took like 16 hours. <laughs> you know, after I worked out some of the basics for improving that, it was much better, but still, uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure it can get much, much better than that. Um, and I, I, yeah, so if I, added, if I added another few election cycles, it should be that much harder. Sorry, Luca. Okay. Uh, do any of the polls actually ask, are you going to vote? And then ask if you voted tomorrow, because that would give more, info, more information about mm. how many people are going to vote and are they, are they maybe changing their mind? Yeah. And whether, if the weather is good, they might change their mind. And, uh, uh, I, I certainly know that some polls do that. I don't know if the New Zealand ones do. 
So I basically rely on them giving their best numbers um, and, and controlling for all of that themselves. I'm, I'm actually, to be honest, I'm not that interested in that. <laughs> this is more an interesting exercise. The better forecast might be yeah. one variable you could put it at least a month before and all the weeks before relaxing already. You could. I mean, again, we come to the problem that there's so few data points, right? We've got five yeah. data points since there's been MNP <laughs> or something, or since we got polls, anyway. Um, last one, I think. Um, I'm wondering, because you were talking about the volatility in Model B, I'm wondering if, did you have a lever that you could have turned to make it this volatile, you know, like a regularization constant? Uh, yeah, so, um, yes. So basically, in, um, is this the right place? Oh, no, that's my actual uh, program. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it, yeah. So there's the, my epsilon, which is the daily innovations, um, and they've got a particular variance, which is set for, in fact, variance covariance matrix, which is varies for the different parties. Then there's a prior probability for that variance covariance matrix. So that prior is my lever. I could squish that right down or, or bring it up either way. And that then it basically um, uh, lets it be more or less volatile. So yes, it's the Bayesianism. Eventually, if you go back far enough, you find someone's made a call somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Finishing um, two things. So um, we're always looking for helpers. So if you're interested in um, helping me, Conrad, and James to organise these events, um, let us know. You can email me directly or email Conrad, or you can email this address. And um, secondly, um, always looking for speakers as well. So if you are um, willing to give a talk, um, do let me know or let us know. So once again, email me directly, Conrad, or this email address. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you.